So also just to clarify, it's A11Y, not Ally. Um, anyway, so today I'm here to talk about accessibility. Um, hopefully Scott didn't scare you off too much from this morning's keynote. Um, accessibility is a bit of a black box for a lot of developers. Um, a, lot of, um, a lot of us see it as a scary constraint um, that probably just leads down to a bunch of really weird QA defects um, that we don't really know how to fix. Um, but as with, any, uh, as with any fear of the unknown, it can usually be squashed just by learning a little bit more about it. So today I hope to give you guys an introduction to accessibility and leave you with some tools for how you can start weaving it into your applications today. So a little bit about myself. My name is Monica. I'm a front-end developer from Toronto, Canada. I work at Shopify and we're a commerce platform that allows users to sell online, in-store and on mobile. And I really consider myself just a typical front-end developer. Um, my main part of the, the main part of my day is just spent building UI. So I'm not actually an accessibility specialist or expert. Uh, it's not the main focus of what I do. So why am I here? Um, well, a bit of a story. Last year, I was at a different company, and a project came my way. And I, in it, I saw it needed to conform to something called WCAG 2.0 Level AA. I had absolutely no idea what this meant. Um, now, up until this point, I had been a developer for around five years, and I thought I kind of had a handle on accessibility, like how hard could it be? But when I saw that requirement, that was the day that I realized that no, um, actually I don't know anything about accessibility. And that was really scary, because I knew I needed to build it out, um, and I had no idea how it would affect my code, or my timelines, or even the features I needed to build would be possible. Um, but that was a, about a year ago, and I've, I've since learned a lot about accessibility, but I've also learned why it's important for us regular developers to start caring about it as well. Because uh, there may very well be you know, a project or a client or a legal requirement even for us to start caring about it. But even more importantly, as developers, we're in a position to make a really big impact on a group of users who, I mean, let's face it, are pretty un underrepresented and you know, almost marginalized on the internet, which isn't really fair. So today, I hope to demystify accessibility a little bit. You can consider this a curated tour of the basics, challenges, and techniques uh, that I found really uh, useful and interesting when I was first starting, and I hope will encourage you guys to continue on where we leave off today. Um, there are a lot of links uh, that are going to be in my slides because I only have 30 minutes to cover a really, really big topic. Um, but everything is going to be posted. All the resources will be available. And um, I'll try and make this as comprehensive as I can, but it's only 30 minutes. So, OK, so I've been up here for a few minutes. I should probably mention what I mean by web accessibility. There's two definitions that I really like because each one underlines a different part of accessibility. So Wikipedia says that when sites are correctly designed, developed, and edited, all users can have equal access to information and functionality. I really like this because it shows that accessibility is a concern for the whole production team. It's as much a design and content question as it is a technical consideration. Next, something that's accessible is something that's able to be easily obtained or used, easily understood or appreciated. I really like this because it actually reminds me of usability, something that I'm sure we're all really familiar with that quality of an application that makes it effective, intuitive, and maybe even fun to use. Well, for me, accessibility just extends that, um, that uh, concept of usability, but just brings it to a more inclusive audience. So I like to think about it that all people should be able to use an application, and it should be easy to use for all people. So who are we considering when we use this umbrella term, accessibility? You know, a common uh, misconception might be that it's just screen reader users. Um, but as we can see from these numbers and this list, it's actually a much more diverse group. And when we look at these numbers collectively, they're also big enough that no one can reasonably say that they don't have an accessibility audience, especially since these numbers are only going to start growing as the general population ages. So the point isn't to sh just satisfy one of these particular groups, uh, but to make something that's more usable across all of them. And the good news is that a lot of the challenges these groups face can be solved with common solutions. So at the start of last year, you know, I was um, about to embark on this new project. And it felt a bit scary because there were so many unknowns. But as developers, we're always uh, used to solving scary new problems, right? So I did what I usually do. And when it came time to dive in, I started with the docs. 
So I knew I needed to conform to WCAG. What's WCAG? Um, well, it stands for the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, and they're a set of guidelines written by the W3C for what websites need to do in order to be accessible. Each, um, so the whole list is divided into three tiers, from A to AAA. Uh, there's a bunch of guidelines that are themselves subdivided. There's a bunch of documents that go along with each set of guidelines. And at the end of the day, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of pages, hours and hours of reading, and a few pages in, and this is what I felt like. I mean, it's really useful as a tool to help evaluate the accessibility of something after the fact, but it's really overwhelming to start learning about accessibility just by reading these docs. So it was a lot more useful, actually, was just to um, think back to some of those simpler definitions, because at the end of the day, the point of accessibility isn't just to check off this laundry list of random guidelines. It's, it's to build something that's more usable. And when we remember that fact, the checklist almost just takes care of itself. So now that we have a simpler understanding of what exactly we're trying to do, there's a few parts of a site that we can optimize immediately to make the biggest impact on accessibility. I'm really going to be breezing through these because this is stuff that we should already be doing. So let's start with how we can make the keyboard experience more accessible. The first thing is to provide obvious focus states for links and buttons. If ever there was an easy accessibility win, this is it. Keyboard users need to see what part of the page has focus, otherwise they have no idea where they are and what link they're about to click on. It would be impossible to navigate a page like this without that little blue outline, so keep it in. There's no reason to remove it. Next, whatever happens on hovers should have a focus fallback, and any click events should have keyboard fallbacks. That also means if you're using any controls that don't have that out of the box, like a span or a div, you can add a tab index and manually bind events. Uh, so use conventions to keep this intuitive. So if you're activating or opening a widget, you know, bind to this space and enter bar. If you're cycling through something like a carousel, use the arrow keys, um, the escape key to close a modal window, stuff like that. Um, Make sure you can always um, get out of any complex keyboard interaction you're introducing as well. So if you're being too smart with your focus and your blur events, make sure a user can always exit whatever interaction. And don't waste users' time by forcing them to tab through giant lists of links. Find a better way to cycle through the content or skip it all together. And finally, depending on the HTML that you use, you can get a lot of this stuff for free. So let's look at the humble select box. Yes, from a design point of view, it's definitely nothing to really write home about, right? But functionally, it's actually really quite rich. You can tab into it, arrow through the different options, uh, type to complete an option, and finally select something out of the box. That's a lot of functionality that you're losing out on if you instead choose a custom component or functionality that you're going to end up having to write yourself. Same thing applies to any uh, controls on your screen. Um, you know, spans and divs don't come with focus or events out of the box. So you can use a link, but even better, since you're probably not actually linking to a URL, use a button. That's what it's there for. Just make your life easier and use what HTML provides. Okay, so moving on to the visuals of the site. Just do your users a favor and make it readable. Um, just start with a good font size and high contrast and use tools to um, evaluate if the color of your text is sufficiently different from your background. Just make it easier on your users. Don't rely on color alone. So this is another one of these classic examples. Um, but for someone with red, green color blindness, this form is not going to be usable. Um, there's no distinction between the fields. Same thing applies to um, figures and graphs. You know, consider using a texture or, sh or different shapes to indicate different parts on a graph. And finally, all images should have a meaningful alt attribute. This is another one of those accessibility tips that's repeated over and over and over again, but for some reason it just refuses to take. The reason why you need to have an alt attribute is because otherwise screen reader users are going to have to either listen to the source attribute on your image, which is usually just like some jumbled string, or you're going to make them listen to this 100 times on a page. Image, image, image that's not really useful and can get really annoying really quickly. So that's why it's important to always include the attribute. There's two great articles here on you know, how to write them best, but just include it. It's another really easy win. So finally, uh, moving on to your forms. Your forms need to work really well because they're the primary way that your users will communicate with you. You don't want to make them guess about what to do or what happened when they tried to submit something. So the easiest thing you can do is provide a label for all of your inputs, a real label using the for attribute that points to the ID of the input. 
Otherwise, when a user is on a screen reader and they enter into a form field, they have no way of knowing what the field is about and they can't actually use your form. You can include a lot of information in a label as well. Um, help text, whether or not the field is required, even error text. That way, all this relevant information is programmatically tied to your input and available to your users. And finally, provide meaningful messages uh, when something happens on your form. So in this case, you know, uh, there was an error on submission. The color changed. This kind of generic message came up. That's not really useful for a lot of users. In this example instead, we actually shifted focus so it's clear that something's actually happened on your page. It's not failing silently and we're providing a really clear indication of what your next steps are and what's missing. Okay. So you heard a really small demo of what a screen reader sounds like and you know it's probably a good idea to have a site work in a screen reader if it's going to be accessible. But it doesn't make sense to optimize for a tool that you know nothing about. So let's take a closer look at screen readers. First, it may surprise you to know, and I can see from the people in the room, that chances are you probably have a screen reader on you right now. OS X comes built in with voiceover, and so does iPhone. Um, there's actually a keyboard command that can activate it right now. You can ask me about that later, because it'll get really loud in the room if everyone does it at the same time. Um, for Android users, you can download TalkBack. For everyone else, I recommend looking at NVDA. It's a free open source screen reader that works really well with Firefox. And the last one that's really popular, especially among heavy Windows users, is JAWS. So now that you know you have access to a screen reader, how do they work? Well, basically, they take the text content on your page and announce it back in the source order. So just like what a browser renders is dependent on the DOM, so all your text elements, your wrappers, your media, your styles, everything you've added in there, what a screen reader um, announces is based on a pared down version of the DOM called the accessibility tree. And it includes all of the text and semantic information on your page. So the screen reader will know what's a heading, what's a link, what used to be an image, but it's not really interested if it happens to be wrapped in a span or a div because all that non-semantic information is basically stripped out. By and large, uh, users navigate using a keyboard using a screen reader, and the vast majority actually have JavaScript enabled, which came as a, you know, a pleasant surprise, to be honest. They are really highly customizable. So as Scott mentioned earlier, um, the, an expert screen reader user will have it set at a really, really high speed. But don't let that scare you off because um, you can, it only takes a few minutes to really get the hang of a screen reader just to start uh, being able to navigate a page. And there's really no substitute for trying one out yourself, especially on a site that you've built. Um, the first time I tried, it was actually a really humbling experience. So I really, really recommend trying it out because um, you'll just get a lot of insight. So one of the ways that screen readers really help their users is um, screen reader users will actually scan through and drill down directly to content, um, much like a sighted user, because they don't want to have to listen to a whole page to know what's available on it. And this is done through HTML shortcuts um, that the screen reader provides. So this is just a screenshot of um, the BBC's new Olympic website. By and large, uh, BBC properties are, are pretty accessible. And using these, HTML sh um, using these shortcuts, uh, screen reader users can jump directly to things like forms, lists, links, and headings. So it sounds really silly to say to a room full of developers, but that means your HTML actually really, really matters. Because if you don't mark things up semantically, users won't be able to find it using this navigation. So headings are actually mo the most popular way that users will navigate a page, and it makes sense because headings are supposed to describe large content on your page. So there's a few things that you can do to optimize this for your users. First, make sure all your content areas have, uh, have headings, otherwise people won't be able to navigate to them easily. How descriptive are your headings? So if you only hear the text of the heading, is it clear what the content below it is about? And finally, do they follow a sensible hierarchy? <laughs> So um, as you drill down from an H1 to an H6, the expectation is that you're actually going into deeper and deeper subsections on your page. And screen readers will actually announce the heading level to back to users. So it can get really confusing if you start skipping around and going directly from an H2 to an H4, for example, because what happened to heading three? It sounds like there's content missing. So this is a really trivial example. Like, no website is actually this simple these days. But this is a good example of the type of outline you want to be creating with your headings, with subsections neatly nested under their appropriate headings. 
So this is beyond the scope of today's presentation, but I really recommend reading more about um, sectioning and headings because it does really affect how users are able to find content on your page. And um, you'd be surprised at how doing things like nesting section elements and using a lot of H1s will actually affect this outline. So um, you know, try and follow through with some of these articles. So at a certain point, you're probably going to want to selectively show and hide content to a screen reader. So Screen readers will ignore images with empty alt attributes. So remember I said always include the alt attribute. If you are using, um, if you are using an image that's purely decorative and has no actual meaning and for some reason you can't just add it as a CSS background, still include the alt attribute but just leave it blank. Screen readers will just gloss right over it. Content that's hidden with display and visibility will also be invisible to the screen reader. Content that's added using before or after pseudo selectors, some screen readers will read it and others won't. So that means you can't have any crucial information in there, but it can't be annoying either. So keep that in mind for things like icon fonts. Um, so there's an article here on how to make them accessible, but you don't want to be flooding your users, uh, making them hear all about your decorative icons. Screen readers won't ignore content that's hidden using opacity, Z index, height. Um, even though this stuff isn't actually visible on the, in this, on the browser, um, it will actually be announced by screen readers, so make sure it makes sense or find another way to hide it. You're, you'll be better off if you, wanna, if you actually do want to selectively show something to screen readers to just position it way off screen using something like text indent or position to absolute. Um, but that can get a little wonky, especially on older mobile devices, so you're better off just using CSS clipping. Um, and this has actually been added to a lot of frameworks just out of the box, like HTML5 boilerplate, Twitter bootstrap. Um, so this is kind of like the safer convention. So there's a lot that I can continue on with screen readers. Um, but I wanted to move on to a couple questions that I started having shortly after I started development. I mean, if I'm implementing a design, what do I do if there's no heading in the design for whatever reason? Maybe it's, it's visually obvious what the section's about. How do I let a screen reader know? What do I do with dynamic content? So if something's being updated on the page, again, how do I let the screen reader know? And finally, I've been looking at some jQuery UI widgets lately, and this is the tab, and I'm noticing some weird looking HTML in there. What's up with that, right? Well, it has to do with something called ARIA, which stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. Um, and it's basically a way of adding extra semantic information onto your elements so that screen readers can better understand and offer better interactions. It's done through a bunch of predefined attributes that are applied directly to your HTML. Um, so as we know, HTML does work out of the box with screen readers, but there are cases where it's difficult to get the full story. So ARIA can be added to fill in some of those missing gaps. It's part of the HTML5 spec. Um, all the modern browsers support it, and most of the major screen readers do as well. One thing uh, to really keep in mind, though, is that though you are adding these attributes right onto the HTML, they don't actually affect any behavior in the browser in terms of styles or functionality. So it's not any kind of a polyfill. It's really just meant as this extra layer to describe things to screen readers. Um, ARIA basically comes in two different uh, flavors. There's roles and states and properties. So ARIA roles create new semantic meaning for the elements that they're applied to. Um, so just like I said earlier, things like divs and spans, they're going to basically be ignored because they don't have semantic meaning out of the box. But if we apply an ARIA role, then they will have some kind of meaning depending on the role. And once you set the ARIA role on the element, it doesn't change. So it stays that way for the life cycle of the application or of the page. There's a few different types of roles, um, but landmarks are probably the ones that you can start using uh, safely right away. And they define top-level page sections um, that can be used for navigation, just like we saw with headings and links earlier. So on the left here, you could see um, all the different possible landmark roles. And you see they kind of match on with uh, HTML5 sectioning elements. And generally, uh, you would apply these ARIA roles onto these sections. So here's another screenshot from the BBC. And I'm using a tool here that finds all the landmark uh, roles on the page and adds this beautiful tanned colored bar. Um, that's the tool. It's not the actual ARIA itself. But now you can see all the, pa all the parts of the page that users can directly navigate to. So they can move straight away to the main navigation, the main content, the footer. 
You'll also notice that all of the content on the page is underneath one of these landmarks, and that's really important. You don't want to orphan anything because then that undermines the whole point of the navigation. So this is just another way to allow users to quickly jump through content so that they can get there faster. So widget roles are another type of ARIA role, and you would generally add these to any of your interactive components. And you can get a sense of what I'm talking about just from like, the list of potential widget roles. So you got things like tooltips and sliders and tabs. Um, so, I mean, let's take a closer look at, it, at the tabs. Um, by and large, a typical tab control has a pretty predictable uh, behavior and structure, right? We've got a bunch of buttons that control and show and hide content below. But other than through this kind of clunky visual tab metaphor, there's no semantic way of actually describing these complex relationships. So when a screen reader gets to this, there's not a whole lot they can say. But when we add ARIA roles to the same HTML, we can inform the screen reader that this is now a tab, and the screen reader can now offer that information back to users and uh, provide a better way of interacting with the component. So where there was no semantic information before, by adding the ARIA roles, we've created that relationship. So where ARIA roles create new semantic meaning, um, states and properties will better describe what's already on the page, um, especially with relationships between content and user interactions. So these are things that will also typically change as the UI changes. So if you have an accordion that's opened or closed, for example, its ARIA state would be updated. One way you can start using these is to provide better labeling of the sections on your page. So when a screen reader um, encounters a section with a label, it'll actually announce the label. And that way, users can make an informed decision. Do they want to continue reading into this section? Or they're not interested, they want to move on. So again, another way of helping navigation. In this case, I'm actually uh, pointing to the ID of an existing text element on the page, and that'll act as a label. We can also pass a string directly, and that'll act as a label. So in this case, you may have more than one navigation on the page, it may not have a header, but this is a way of describing what the purpose of that navigation is. So the cool thing about ARIA is that it is just HTML, so you can use it in other ways as well. I kind of like using it as a selector, for example, because now it forces me to update uh, ARIA because I'm, I need it to update the styles as well, and I can get away with adding fewer JavaScript classes because I don't need them as a styling hook anymore. So I've really only skimmed the surface here, um, but going back to jQuery UI's tab example, when we add roles, states, and properties to the same HTML, we create a much richer experience for screen reader users. So there's a few um, examples here of uh, libraries and articles on how to better use ARIA. I really have to single out jQuery UI because I know that they've done a lot of partnering with accessibility specialists to really improve how usable the widgets are on uh, screen readers, um, especially uh, through the use of ARIA. Um, so I really recommend looking at these and especially trying them out in a screen reader because you'll really get a better sense of how, um, how all of the uh, different pieces fit together and um, how you can maybe start using ARIA on your own widgets. So of course, as with any new technology, um, a few caveats to think about. So first, ARIA is really meant as a bridge and not as a replacement. As this descriptive layer that falls between your HTML and a screen reader, ARIA can have a really big impact on how your application is interpreted. So you really have to make sure you're using the best um, attributes possible to make sure those, meaning, those relationships are conveyed properly. And if you can use plain HTML to achieve the same semantics, then that's absolutely the way you should go. ARIA is really only meant as a last resort. You can't slap on a bunch of ARIA onto an inaccessible page and hope it'll suddenly work either. So you still have to manage all of your own events, the focus state, make sure the color still makes sense. It's really just there to better describe what's happening on the page. And the only way to know for sure if it's actually adding value to your users is to test it. Um, even if you're using an established convention, test how you've actually implemented it to make sure it's working as expected. So this is a bit of homework, I guess, but these are all really good um, resources to learn more about ARIA, especially from the W3C, which includes really detailed guides on how to actually build widgets. Um, so definitely check some of these out. And again, I will be posting my slides, so you'll have these. So let's move on now to how we can start testing some of these things to make sure that they're actually working as expected. And I mean, it goes without saying, test early, test often. You want to know if you're on the right track. So the easiest way to get started is to start using automated tools. And these are going to be really good at finding a lot of accessibility basics, like missing labels, missing alt tags, invalid ARIA. 
The first three are browser uh, extensions that um, I recommend using a combination of them because each will have its own different features and tests. The last is actually um, a jQuery plugin that comes with its own uh, set of tests that you can also extend. Um, they happen to be having a sprint tomorrow, so you should um, check out quailjs.org or uh, come chat with me afterwards. I can give you the information. Um, but it's a good opportunity to learn more about accessibility and you know, participate in an open source project. Automated testing is only, unfortunately, going to get you part of the way. Um, as with something as nuanced as accessibility, uh, you're going to get your deepest insights by manually testing your pages. But there are a few things that you can do pretty easily. Um, so start testing with um, the images disabled. Uh, is all the content still there? Does it all still make sense? Put the mouse away. Can you still navigate the whole page? Submit a form. Manipulate form values. And finally, load it in multiple screen readers. Um, you know, as, as Scott kind of mentioned um, again earlier, um, the screen reader environment is similar to browsers. I mean, you don't want to just optimize for a single case. So I really recommend trying it out in at least a couple of the different brands that I mentioned earlier. Now's the time to maybe pull out one of those checklists uh, that you saw at the beginning of a project, maybe. But you can always just keep it simple and ask yourself, does my page make sense, and is it usable? Um, so a few things to think about, you know, as you get started more with testing and learning more about accessibility, it is a really big topic. Um, but you have to start somewhere. So it's okay if you start small. Even small changes can make a really big impact on your users. As you increase your, you know, accessibility knowledge and experience, you can start priority prioritizing pages and sections to optimize next. So maybe it'll be your main nav or high, high traffic areas like the home page. And finally, document things as you go, because eventually you're going to move on to another project. And you're going to want the accessibility practices that you've started to continue. So you're going to want to leave the next developer uh, with the resources uh, to continue on the work that you've started. So over the past year, um, I have learned a lot about accessibility. But being a regular developer, uh, there's also a few lessons that have kind of stayed with me apart from kind of the technical aspect. So first. Accessibility is a lot easier when you plan for it. I think one of the reasons why it's got this scary black box reputation is because too often people will try and bake it in at the very end of a project, or sorry, tack it on to the very end of a project. Um, and I mean, adding a new feature at that point is going to be a nightmare anyways. That's not limited to accessibility. But if you plan for it like you would anything else, you don't need any kind of special process or structure. It doesn't need to be that hard. Next, um, as I've been doing research, I've kind of stumbled into this um, amazing community of developers and advocates that are really willing to help out and just really dedicated to educating about accessibility. There is no shortage of blog posts and tweets and discussions out there on accessibility. You just need to know where to look. Um, so I have, I've actually included a couple of resources at the very end uh, to kind of give you uh, some of that information. And finally, accessibility is the kind of thing that once you're aware of it, it's really hard to put it away. Um, I mean, I, I got started because this project had these requirements. Um, but I mean, that was a year ago, and the project's long over. Um, but now that I've seen how some of my dev decisions can make such a big impact on users, and how the quality of my development has actually increased because I'm a lot more aware of these things, it's something that I continue to practice and something that I continue to notice. Um, and it wasn't really expected, but now it is more and more part of my day to day. So learning about accessibility is a really big topic. And it can be really frustrating, because there is a lot of information. But to keep it all in perspective, what really helped me was just reminding myself that behind all the checklists and rules and extra testing, there's just people trying to use your site. So make it usable for everybody. Thanks.